Welcome to Step Into a Story. This is episode number eight, and I'm very pleased to have one of uh, what I am told is the world's foremost medieval writers, Elizabeth Chadwick, uh, with 28 books. So um, let me find the correct page. Um, as I mentioned, all this technical difficulty, I got my pages in the wrong order. Elizabeth Chadwick was born in England, spent her childhood in Scotland near Glasgow, and moved to Nottingham when she was 10 and has lived there ever since. She has told herself stories all her life and started writing them when she was 15. Her first foray into historical fiction was a novel about the Holy Land in the 12th century. In 1989, after years of writing and rejections, her book The Wild Hunt was auctioned to Michael Joseph of Penguin. A year later, the book won a Betty Trask Award, which was presented to the author at Whitehall by the Prince of Wales. Congratulations. Elizabeth Chadwick has gone on to become one of Britain's foremost historical novelists as, and has been called by the Historical Novel Society the best writer of medieval fiction currently around. She has published internationally and her work has been translated into 16 languages. Chadwick is renowned for her extensive research into the medieval period, and particularly so in the area of the Marshall and Bigod families. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Um, there's, there's dispute over what it is, but it looks like it's um, by God. By God, okay. Um, and that's an interesting detail because we really don't know what the language sounded like, you know, hundreds of years ago. So the by God families, her novels about the 13th century magnate William Marshall, The Greatest Knight, and The Scarlet Lion have brought her international acclaim. So I am very pleased to have you here. Thank you for being here, and it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, normally I have the author give an intro to the book, but because you have 28, it's a little bit harder to sum it up. <laughs> um, but one thing I'll say, they're, they're all set roughly between, I have the dates here, if I can find them, uh, the late 10 hundreds, early 11 hundreds, up until what, about the mid 12 hundreds, I think? I think so. I am venturing further further forward in, t in time. Um, the new British one, um, Marriage of Lions, um, published in the UK, is um, we're on to the um, 13th, 13th century. Okay. In that. Yeah, what I found really interesting as I looked over the blurbs for your books was that I realized the history behind your books sort of leaves off where mine begins because I write primarily right around the Battle of Bannockburn, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. And it was interesting that I knew some of these names because the whole events of Bannockburn backed up to things that happened in the reign of Henry II. And I just, I found that really interesting that what happened, you know, 200 years ago was still impacting people in the 1300s. So it's always interesting to know when and how writers started you started actually writing them when you were 15 what, what prompted you at that point to start writing um i actually fell in love with a guy on a tv program called really? crusade mm -hmm. um you can still find it on youtube uh because it was dubbed from french into english for the bbc mm -hmm. children's programs so you can find it as thibault ou les croissards um on youtube uh -huh. and uh, i fell in love with the hero and uh, began writing a piece of fan fiction, which suddenly developed a life of its own. Uh -huh. And uh, I thought, oh, I want this is what I want to do for a living. I mean, I told myself stories before then, um, but this was the catalyst that actually started me writing it down when I was 15. I wrote, a, it took me a year, when I was 16, I had a full length novel. That's and I thought, right. yeah, that's what I'm gonna do for a living. I'm going to write historical fiction. And it was all because I rather fancied this, this, this tall, dark, handsome guy on a, historical program was, was like a presenter of a documentary or was he an actor he was an actor it's uh it, it was called desert crusader um in in english dubbed from the french and it was about a man who had adventures in the holy land uh, i think he was half syrian and half um half from europe so he uh -huh. moved between two cultures um, but he was was a, uh, a knight and uh um he was very handsome to look at and i i like the sort of adventure story um involved in it um mm -hmm. and uh i just wanted to write this sort of historical adventure tale 
And That's because I, I wanted it to feel as real as possible, so I began researching. Mm -hmm. And the more research I did, the more interested I became in the period, and the more I wanted to write it. Mm -hmm. So it just went around in a circle. That's kind of what's been happening to me. And, you know, so you were ironically inspired by an actor to start writing. Do you have authors who inspired you? I guess I began enjoying historical fiction with Mary Stewart and Crystal Cave. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I uh, got interested in this, this night chap, I began reading history set in the medieval period. So mm -hmm. I don't know how you pronounce her name, it's a soft G or a hard G, but I really uh, enjoyed the novels of Roberta Gellis. I don't mm -hmm. know if it's Gellis or Gellis. Um, and also, of course, Sharon K. Penman and mm -hmm. um, Dorothy Dunnett. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were, my view, like my inspirations. And I, I was reading them before I actually took to, to writing in depth, I suppose. You know, um, Sharon K. Penman, I believe she recently passed away, didn't she? Uh, yes, she did. Yes. Yeah, um, it's yeah. Interesting. She was very close friends. I believe she became friends with a novelist who lived just across the river from me when I was still down in the Twin Cities. And um, so I'll actually be talking to her, I think, next week or a couple of weeks from now. So I took part in a tribute to Sharon because she's a personal friend as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we used to correspond in detail when I was uh, first published before the days of the internet. I got you know, a stash of letters from her, and I wrote to her as well. Mm -hmm. Was she publishing before you were? Oh yes, quite a bit before. Um, but in my own little way, I was writing Henry the Second before she was as, as an unpublished author, because I uh -huh. began writing at fifteen, and it took the age of um, thirty-two to get published. Um, so oh. I was doing Henry the Second when I was right. still a teenager. <laughs> when, when you finally got published at thirty-two, did you have a whole stack of manuscripts ready to go? I had eight, um, but none of them. They, they were they were apprentice pieces, though. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready to be published. Mm -hmm. There was only one of those eight has been published, and that was um, fairly recently. And I, I re-edited it and rewrote it quite considerably. It's called The Coming of the Wolf. Um, you know, I have a friend who always said, you throw away the first million words. And so that's the great thing about starting when you're 15, or like I started when I was 10. And so by the time I had something published, I'd probably, you know, written a couple million words. That's right. But sometimes amongst all those million words, there are moments that are, that are good. And mm -hmm. you can sometimes Definitely. save those paragraphs for later or, or build on them. Um, there's also a lot of rubbish, but <laughs> you start getting better as you get better. Right. But you've still got those flashes. Even, even when you're writing rubbish, you've still got standout paragraphs that are actually mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's been my problem because we just moved to this new house and I've got all these boxes of old manuscripts and I keep saying, why am I calling these with me? Get rid of them. But then I go, there might be gold in there. I'm going to go back someday. And, you know, um, so in reading the descriptions of your books, you clearly love medieval history. And I think most of your books are based on true stories. Um, they've changed as I've gone on. My, my early novels were, I suppose, what you call romantic historicals with imaginary protagonists set on a, um, if you like, a real background. Mm -hmm. um, but then about halfway through, I changed and started writing about real people. Um, mm -hmm. That tended to be the way historical fiction was going in the UK. Mm -hmm. it, it hit a slump in the late 90s. And when it picked up again, um, the person responsible for actually picking up historical fiction was Philip Gregory. With the other Berlin girl and suddenly historical fiction was hot again but mm -hmm. the hot historical fiction was biographical fiction it had gone from that imaginary into all the bio biographical at that time mm -hmm. I think it's changed uh, changed out again since um, to an extent but um, I changed around that time of the other Berlin girl um, to writing about real people and really found my niche I think. Why, why do you think it's so important for us to tell the stories of the past? Oh, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting question. I've got to, I have to go away and think about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's always with us, with us, isn't it? It's part of who we are. We carry it with us. Um, what, whatever, the past comes with us as, as we come into the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think that, that's it. You learn an awful lot from the past. You find but, out that human people don't change. Mm -hmm. And really that's don't. interesting, you know, as I study 
history and you know here I am a modern American and I'm digging into Robert the Bruce a warrior in the 1300s and this is what you learn human nature never really changes you know we're dealing with Absolutely. same motivation same same problems really when you come right down to it Absolutely. and society and technology changes um, I think um, so there'll be a, a pendulum swinging from, if you like, liberal to conservative, and that's just an, on a in constant swing. And um, and it's the same, and technology will make, makes a difference as well. Right. Um, you know, all the phone scrolling these days, <laughs> you know, and news is instant, bam, 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 all the information, you know. Um, right. But it still makes us very tribal, as we were back then. It, you know. And it seems like we're getting more tribal, not less. <laughs> I think so. I think we are, absolutely. Yeah. So you're 20. I, 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 same. What? Right. Wait. Sorry. Um, no, yeah. we're having It's still, still probably the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So your, your 28 books cover from 1067 in The Winter Mantle to 1238 in The Marriage of Lions. And quite a few of them, it looked to me like involve Henry II or the direct family. Uh, yeah. Why does this particular period and this particular family call to you so much? What is it you find so fascinating about them? I would say it still goes back to my um, to that, that first um, novel and I had to um, begin researching them. And the mm -hmm. more I researched, the more interested I became. And it's just that that general interest and, and, and reading around the subject, really. And the more you read, the more you find out across all disciplines. Right. That means, you know, archaeology and, um, you know, clothing, textiles, what they ate. And you can just go down hundreds of different rabbit holes. The more you find out, the more you realize, the less you know. <laughs> yeah. well, I think that's part of it. That is so true. <laughs> yeah, that is so um, true. I mean, I ended up where I would spend a day and a half researching buttons. Did they have buttons in 1314? Yeah. Um, and it's it's almost embarrassing when I think back to what I didn't know when I first started writing my book. I was like, did they have Canon in 1314? And now that's so obvious to me. And yet, Canon actually were introduced fairly close to my time period. So, yes. I didn't, you know, think I should have known that. But yeah, I realized my, I, I know nothing. So you have a reading prepared for us and you promised me medieval monkeys. Yes, it's a short one. I was trying to find something for five minutes after you mentioned it had to be five minutes. Uh -huh. um, and I suddenly, I just picked up a book and thought, oh, what can I do? You know, fiddle, fiddle. And then I found this little excerpt, which is from The Winter Crown, which is the second of the uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine trilogy, which is are, are available in the United States. And it's um, a story about a, The Winter Crown is mostly Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine's marriage. And um, to set the scene, uh, Thomas Beckett, who was Henry's chancellor at this time, which is in the summer of 1158, was um, heading out to Paris with um, lots of gifts for King Louis of France because a marriage was going to be arranged between um, Eleanor and Henry's son, yep, small son, uh, and the Louis' small daughter. I think they were, I, I've forgotten without looking it up, but they were, they were young children. And um, so this is about Beckett organising this big load of gifts. And uh, so shall I just start, start yeah. my reading? Yeah, OK, we're at Westminster, summer 1158. Look, Mama, look. Eleanor raised her head as Henry burst into the room, his small face shining. Sorry, that should be Harry. Harry is the young king to differentiate him from Henry's dad. His father and Thomas Beckett followed more sedately. Perched on Henry's shoulder was a small brown monkey with a chain around its neck. It clutched a date in its dexterous leathery hands and was busily eating the fruit and glancing round out of intelligent dark eyes. Eleanor stared, not knowing whether to laugh or be dismayed. A monkey in the chamber was the last thing she needed. Her women were all cooing and making silly kissing noises with pursed lips. Well, what do you think of this as a gift for Louis? Henry asked, chuckling. I thought it could sit on his shoulder and give him advice, since monkeys are renowned for their wisdom. It's called Robert, Harry said earnestly. I want to keep him. I oh, know, my boy, Henry wagged his finger. This is a gift for the King of France. When you're older, perhaps. 
Eleanor raised her brows. Indeed, what a good idea, she said. You could replace your own advisors with monkeys and all it will cost you will be a few bags of almonds and dates. Think of the saving. Henry grinned. What do you say to that, Thomas? What if I were to replace you with a monkey? Beckett smiled with vinegar on his lips. I'm sure you would find it most enlightening, sire. The monkey clambered onto, him, onto Henry's shoulder, wrapped its tail around his neck and began industriously searching his hair for lice. Aliena burst out laughing. Certainly it will perform more functions than you, Master Chancellor, and that would be a miracle. Henry grabbed the creature off his head, making it screech and handed it back to Beckett. Master Thomas has lots and lots of monkeys. Henry's voice was high with excitement. He screwed up his face as he calculated. Twelve! Come see them, Mama, come see! He seized her hand and tugged. Why twelve? Alienor gave Thomas a cynical look. Was one not enough? <laughs> Thomas exchanged glances with Henry and smiled. One to ride each pack horse bearing gifts when I enter Paris, madam, he said, and then later they will be presented to select members of the French court. The intention is to show Louis how much wealth and power I have at my disposal, Henry said, and also to make a spectacle for the French people. Henry slapped his Chancellor's shoulder in the same way he'd slap a horse's neck when it had performed well for him. Thomas has been particularly inventive, not only monkeys for wisdom, but also a parrot that can say the paternoster and two golden eagles. His eyes sparkled with mirth and pride, not to mention assorted packs of hounds, guard dogs and enough furs, fabrics and furniture to equip a palace. Is there anything left in the treasury or are you giving it all to the French? She queried in a biting tone. It sounded like a vulgar assemblage of unprecedented proportions. What Louis with his, with his ascetic, ta ascetic tastes would make of it all, she dreaded to think. But perhaps the rest of Paris would marvel. It sat ill with her that all their money and effort was being spent on soliciting a match of which she disapproved. Thomas performed a suave bow. Rest assured, madam, I have not spent beyond the king's means. How oh, good to know, Eleanor replied disdainfully. But to humour Henry and satisfy her own curiosity, she donned her cloak and allowed herself to be taken to see the fruits of Thomas's toil. The noise and the smell of the menagerie Beckett had assembled was overwhelming. Eleanor had to cover her nose with her wimple. There were packs of dogs, as Henry had said, black and tan slot hounds with lugubrious features, floppy ears and low yodelling barks. Curly-coated otter hounds from the Welsh borders, darting terriers yappy and energetic, and great golden mastiffs as big and muscular as lions for guarding the numerous wagons being assembled to carry the masses of gifts and baggage. Harry's eyes were as wide as moons as he moved from area to area, cage to cage, exclaiming at everything he saw. Henry took Harry on his arm. It will all be worth it, I promise. They do say that the more you pay, the more it's worth. He gave her a hard stare. You have to look beyond the personal things to the long term. This alliance with France will give us the lands of the Vexin when Han Hen Harry and Marguerite marry. Making peace with Louis will enable us to take an army down to Toulouse and restore it to the Duchy of Aquitaine. This is the means to achieve that goal. Eleanor compressed her lips. She still thought all this show was about Thomas Beckett's desire for lavish gestures and Henry's determination to outshine and overwhelm Louis with a flamboyant display of all the resources he possessed and Louis did not. It was no more than one dog pissing higher up the wall than a rival. Nevertheless, if they did gain the city of Toulouse, which she had long coveted for Aquitaine, then this circus might just be worth it. Trust me, Henry said, and smiled at her with the broad, straight grin that she knew never to trust. Taking Harry in his arms, he went to look at the stable of horses Beckett was assembling for the parade. That was a fantastic scene. Uh, very vivid. Captured all of that. I thought it was interesting just by dumb luck, you picked a scene that hit on all we've just been talking about, how human nature is still the same. You know, the motivations are yes. still the same. Uh, this conflict between the husband and wife. Mm -hmm.